Hello, everyone. Good morning. And depending on where you're calling in from, good afternoon and good evening. Happy November to you. My name is Shelby, and on behalf of Twill, I am thrilled to welcome you to our webinar today, Survive the Holidays with Emotional Intelligence. Thank you all so much for tuning in with us here today. Our topic is rather timely as we enter into the hustle bustle of the holiday season. Lots of excitement and naturally lots of room for, well, stress and relational tension, if we're being honest with ourselves. <laughs> the good news is the better we come to understand our emotions and those of others, the easier it is to navigate and strengthen our connections. In today's webinar, our co-panelists will cover the science behind emotional intelligence, tips for perceiving people and situations more fairly to avoid misunderstandings, and the one thing we're all waiting for, the one question to ask yourself to ensure that your relationships survive the holidays. I am absolutely honored to host Dr. Susan Coe and Dr. Christine Coe, who I will be introducing in just a moment. While we give everyone a minute to sign on today, I'd love to get to know you all a little bit. If you are open, please share your name and where you're calling in from in our chat. We've got Chicago, Syracuse, Oslo, hi, Chicago area, Portland, Hawthorne, New Jersey, Michigan, Colorado, Phoenix, Arizona, New York City, Virginia, California, representation from all over the country. This is and world. So neat to see. Hi, Josh from New York City. Lovely. We so value the presence of this audience joining in to connect today through learning. Before we get started, I want to go over just a few details. Today's webinar will be recorded and available on our content channel, The Upside, in about a week for on-demand viewing. The link to rewatch it and share it will be sent to the email you used to sign up in about seven days. Please feel free to send it along to anyone who couldn't be here with us live today. We'll be opening it up for a Q&A at the end of today's presentation, so please stay tuned and participate. You can write any questions that you have using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. We're going to try our very best to address them all, or at least the amount that we have time for. And because time is limited and of the essence, there's a really neat upvote option. So if there's a question you'd really like to see answered, make sure that you upvote it. We will not be sharing a copy of the PowerPoint presentation today separately from the recording, but again, you'll be able to view it on demand in just about a week at your convenience. If you have any additional questions, please email team at twill.health at any time. I'll pop that into the chat in just a bit. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to today's experts. Let's please welcome Dr. Susan J. Coe and Dr. Christine J. Coe to the stage. Hello. I'm just going to introduce you very briefly. You both have extensive and extraordinary backgrounds. As a clinical psychologist, Dr. Susan J. Co. combines cognitive behavioral therapy, psychodynamic psychotherapy, and emotional intelligence to help clients learn skills to improve communication and connection in their relationships. She's also a clinical liaison here at Twill. Her sister, Yale School of Medicine professor, Dr. Christine Jaco, is a dermatologist and dermopathologist. On her podcast, See, Hear, Feel, co-leads psychology experts in discussions focused on ways to improve the ability to observe and manage emotions. And with that, I will hand it over to you both. Thank you everyone for being here today. We really wanted to talk about how to survive holidays with emotional the topic that's uh, near and dear to our hearts. Um, so what we wanted to do is, is share first some, some background, uh, current, current context. We think it's important to, to think about what's going on. Obviously, this is about the holidays, but why, uh, what else is going on? Um, we were going to share about the science, um, a bit about the science. Don't worry, we're not going to delve too deeply into it. And then as Shelby said, we have some a, a question for you to ask yourself and really some tips and tricks because we all know that uh, having tools and resources uh, and skills to build is, is really the best. And most importantly, we really do want to hear from all of you. So please do um, put your questions in the Q&A. Um, we would love to, to make this as interactive as possible. We've all spent a lot of time on video over the past few years. Um, and so the more kind of we can actually um, talk to each other, uh, even in a in a video space like this, we'd really love that. So please don't don't hesitate, and and we'll try to to pause and and ask about what questions are coming up at different moments. 
So I think, you know, where we want to start is, is we love this quote um, from Malcolm Gladwell. He kind of talks about this idea of our first impression. So if you think about, you know, for yourself, you know, what, what um, how do you make your first impressions, right? So you can think about you're on a date. Um, where do those first impressions come from? And they're, often they're very automatic, right? And I, we love this, this idea that they're fragile, um, that sometimes if we don't appreciate how fragile they are, we don't recognize how much of an impact they actually have on our actions, our thoughts, our assumptions. Um, but what we perceive, and sometimes those split second moments can um, really have an impact on how we act and react in a situation. So did you want to share some about, about the, uh, the photo here that we're looking at? Yeah, so the photo on the left, um, we will have a poll in just a second. So just look at it and I'll just explain a little bit about it. This is one of the oldest optical illusions that is out there. So it is uh, from a temple in India. And so Shelby is going to start a poll. And I think people are going to be filling this out. But um, I will say that I see a bull. Um, and Susan um, will outline it because I think she has the, or maybe actually neither of us have the ability to do that, um, but maybe, um, yes, thank you. So I see from the left side of the body, um, oh, cool. So look at this. So 45 people, actually 63% of the people um, who have joined us, for this, I'm not actually seeing an elephant. So they are going with the body from the right side um, towards a head. Both of these animals share the same eye. But what's the horn of the bull is actually the tusk of the elephant and the trunk of the elephant is resting on the upper back of what I think is the bull. So 21% see it as bull, 63% elephant, no one chose dog, 11% chose goat and 6% chose other. Please let us know if you said other what you think um, it is. No, so curious. There's, there's no right answer here. And this is this is the point of doing this optical illusion. I could swear upwards and backwards, this is a bull, it's a bull, it's a bull, but it's also an elephant. Like both things can be true at the same time. So that I think goes along with this quote that's right there. And um, um, oh, cool. So, so Michelle Wall says, um, I see a bull and an elephant hugging with the bull's head in front. Oh. Aww. So the elephant's trunk is wrapping around the bull's neck. Oh, that's beautiful. And that's perfect, too, for our topic on surviving the holidays, because I think, yeah. you know, really, it's about love, right? The love that we have for our family and friends and those we see and why sometimes it just sort of gets messed up for whatever reason. So, uh, yeah, I really love that too. We, I promise we didn't plant Michelle in the audience to say that, but <laughs> it's a really good answer. So when we say, you know, this, this little webinar today is about emotional intelligence. So wh what do we actually mean by that? And it's the, it's kind of the naming of your own emotions, um, and as well as the ability to name others, right? So kind of what am I feeling? Um, how do I manage what I'm feeling and how do I take what I'm feeling and use it? Um, deliberately, right? So, you know, sometimes all of this happens in a split second, and we all know what it's like to have that reaction right away. And then you think about it and you're like, wow, I went from zero to 5,000 in a millisecond. Um, and maybe you didn't even know why. And you have to kind of reflect and think later about what happened in that moment. But the more practice that we have at kind of thinking about what our emotions are, um, about naming them, uh, that the more ability we will we will gain to be able to do that because just like every skill, it takes practice. Um, and, you know, the more that we do that in our interactions, we can have more successful interactions. We can have better communication. We can have stronger relationships. And, you know, part of why um, we, we thought this is uh, relevant to talk about today is because the holidays are a, a time where um, certainly for many of us, uh, we have a lot going on. It's the end of the year, you know, regardless of which holidays you do or don't celebrate, the end of the year in and of itself can um, bring up a lot uh, with, with work and year-end things um, as well. So this is something that um, we're gonna go over in a little bit more detail, but we, I'm an impatient person. <laughs> I like to know what's going to happen. I read ends of books first. I like 
finding out what's going to happen in a movie. I'll read the synopsis before if I can. So this is really one of the bottom lines. So really map how I feel, how we feel, how we feel together in a group by myself, really just name the emotion. And um, we'll go over why this may seem hard, but one of the reasons is that Brene Brown, um, a well-known author and speaker, has a new book out there called Atlas of the Heart. And she talks about this, how most adults actually can only name three emotions. So if you want to go ahead and put in the chat, if you feel, you know, you can name more, I would say that I really started off with very low emotional intelligence and being able to map how I feel, name how I feel, and also maybe name others and one of the, how other people feel. And one of the things that Brene Brown points out is that maybe we actually should not be trying to name how someone else feels, but just ask. That's a great point. So we wanted to, you know, start with the current context. We're talking about the holidays. This is the, the time period that we're in. Um, certainly with Thanksgiving coming up in a, in a few weeks, I think we can all feel that rush. And I know, you know, over and over again, people have said as you get into meetings, wow, it's, it's already November. And, you know, kind of feeling that, that rush. But I think beyond just the holidays, we know that this um, current time, there, there has been a lot that's been going on over the last few years, you know, as we kind of referenced with COVID and the pandemic and working from home and all of these different things, that's, that also serves as the backdrop. So given that, you know, for me, the holidays is my favorite time of year. I, I really enjoy this period of time. I um, get excited about it. And um, this year was no different, except that actually I became more excited about the holidays even earlier. Um, so because I have, uh, I was invited to dog Halloween and it was my <laughs> really exciting for me and my, uh, my little dog here, Lola, to be invited to a dog Halloween party. And this happened in uh, September. And so for me that the holidays are already, I was like, wow, it's already starting. And I was just, it was just pure excitement, really excited um, to, to kind of be invited to this party and be thinking about it. And then, you know, I found that within weeks of that, really actually within kind of days of it, I was hearing more and more. So I have the benefit of, of having a practice and I'm um, working with a lot of clients uh, and was hearing from people, oh yeah, Halloween. And then, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up and what are you doing for the holidays? And we're thinking about traveling. We're, we're thinking about family and where are we going to go and what are we going to do? And so all of it started to, to come up. So this slide again. Yes. So, you know, when you heard um, about dog Halloween, my sister told me about it and I was fascinated. I was kind of like, oh, that's really interesting. So some of my emotions were as excited for her. I don't have a dog. So it was totally new to me that people even do dog Halloween. And so I would say I, I echo some of the emotions that people named. I was excited. I was happy for her. Um and so um, th that's just a way you can name. And, and I have a story that, oh, it sounds like a fun party. Um, and so that's just an example of how you can name. It's a simple example. We're starting simple. So we started, so I started with that excitement. As I said, you know, the holidays are, are you know, uh, exciting period of time for me. I really enjoy it. And then I think rapidly I started to realize that, oh, wow, I have this and then Thanksgiving is coming up and I need to travel and I have a few different projects that I'm going to have to work on and get done by the end of the year. And all of a sudden I started to feel like this. Um, and so, you know, I thought this this you know, kind of New Yorker cartoon is really apt. I was hearing this a lot from my clients as well. Just this idea that, wow, now I'm, I'm starting to feel this mix of emotions, actually, there's excitement, I'm looking forward to seeing my family, um, being able to spend some time together, maybe even having some time off. Um, but I'm also feeling a lot of pressure uh, because of a lot of other things that I'm going to have to manage. So when we talk again about this, this question of how we feel, you know, you can hear some of the, um, the, the, the mix of emotions. And so I think that's an important thing, too, is that as Christina was saying, um, you know, Brene Brown books, I can't remember how many emotions she does name in the Atlas. It's um, almost a hundred. I think it's like, yeah. so, uh, so, you know, most adults, they can name three. Is that what you said? And um, they're over a hundred. So if you think about 
we often actually, emotions are actually much more complex. So naming the emotions, as much as it feels pretty simple, it could be a lot of different feelings. And sometimes we don't actually even know what it is that we're feeling. Um, so when I think about the holidays, so I think this was a, just kind of a, a, a visual to think through what are some of the things that are coming up in terms of the context, right? So you have the holiday season. And with that, of course, also just, you know, being thoughtful about for different cultures, we may celebrate or not celebrate different holidays. And that's kind of something that comes up too, and sometimes can also um, be its own stress and pressure, because we live in a society that maybe has an expectation of like, oh, of course, you're going to celebrate Christmas, or you're going to celebrate Thanksgiving, or whatever. And maybe those are not, you know, holidays that you celebrate. There's, there's pressure around that. Um, Traveling, you know, I think uh, I, I know that uh, with the with COVID being kind of us finally being in a little bit of a different phase, um, one of the, the challenges I've heard are for there are people who really do want to travel, which I think on the one hand is great, but I think the flip side of that is that for um, some some of the the airlines and things have been overloaded and and we were seeing a lot of travel delays and challenges. So we know that that's always a little bit of. Um, this period of time and with weather and things like that. But I think, you know, the other thing to, to consider is the backdrop of, but beyond kind of the holidays and the mix of feelings, the fun, the joy, the excitement, but the, the challenge, the stress is also, you know, let's not forget that this is a backdrop of we've been in year, a multi-year pandemic and for uh, that was, that was a kind of completely new experience for all of us. And, we know that some of the, the real challenges of that were about our relationships, right? Because there was the social isolation, particularly in the beginning, as people were trying to figure out, you know, you're not supposed to be out, you're supposed to, you know, and then, then it was like, well, we could form a pod or you can be with certain people, um, but really limit kind of your social interactions. And so, um, and then, you know, as we talked about all, just being on video all the time, not going to the office. And so we saw all of this kind of, um, uh, discussion in the popular press, right? There was the New Yorker article about, or the New York Times article about languishing um, at, that that really people, I think, really related to. And then we had things like, um, you know, kind of burnout um, that, that we've, people have experienced with work. Um, we've heard the, about the great resignation, quiet quitting. So there are all of these things that kind of signal to us that it's been a really challenging period of time. Um, I see a lot of couples in my practice. And so I can tell you that even um, in just kind of mapping what the pandemic looked like for relationships, I, I could I could show you. I mean, it's a, it's a qualitative um, uh, study. It's not scientific, but I can tell you that in the beginning of the pandemic, there were a lot of relationships that were accelerated because people were saying, okay, well, you know, we can't hang out with one but each other, so we might as well live together. And then, you know, over time, we saw, uh, you know, a lot of stress on relationships because there was that social isolation and maybe less ability to to do more with, with others. So um, that is a big part, I think, of where we've been. And so when we think about perhaps the pressure that this period of time, the holidays may be posing for some you know, as maybe this is for many people, I think this year is the first time that um, maybe you've been able to see your family, particularly if they're far away. Um, I've heard that a lot. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go see my family. I haven't seen them for a few years now. And so that, that can also pose its own pressure, even if it's exciting. So again, just to kind of recognize that there is a lot um, in the background uh, that's that's going on in addition to to what we see uh, coming up in, in terms of just the holidays themselves. And so if we we're going to keep showing this one, I think it might be um, one of our last times, but just to kind of, you know, um, to, to again, practice. Right. So we we could, we named a bunch of different things here, you know, being excited, happy, maybe um, feeling stress, also feeling, you know, maybe anxious. Right. About what is what is it going to be like? Oh, wow. I love my family. But I'm spending 15 days with them. And I kind of had learned before that the 10 day mark was really <laughs> the, the max. So, you know, there are things like this where you, we, we recognize that there are a mix of, of different feelings. I think we were gonna ask um, for another poll. So, you know, if you thought about how are you feeling about the holidays? 
looks like the major emotion is anxious. Um, it makes sense since the title of this webinar is how to survive the holidays. I think it probably, um, you know, draws in people who are feeling a little anxious, but you know, there's, there's a mix here, excited, happy, neutral, overwhelmed other. Um, so anxious was about 30% and then everything else, oh, neutral was about 20% and then everything was a little bit over 10, excited, happy, overwhelmed. Thank you for sharing all that. And I think it, you know it's a good point, right? We we just shared what five different <laughs> different feelings here, and you know as we're we're saying, um, there are many many more different ways to to name our emotions. So uh, we could think about there that probably was also an incomplete way to describe it, but um, it's a start. You know, we I think we just wanted to to start to think about it. Um, we love this quote that it's not the one speaking the same language, but the one sharing the same feeling that understand each other. So Rumi, of course, is, you know, um, kind of beautifully speaks to lots of different feelings and can kind of articulate this in a way. Uh, but, you know, I think what we really like about this is that it's kind of saying, it's not just about what you say, right? It, it is about what you, you feel and what we often perceive, you know, think about when you're interacting with someone, what are you using as your data points to try to understand what someone else is feeling or what you're feeling? Is it only the words that are being spoken? Um, is it, you know, what you what you kind of assume is happening? How are you kind of um, trying to figure out that data? So if we look at actually what the research says, um, you know, how do we kind of communicate? What do we perceive? Interestingly, what we wanted to kind of point out here is that 55% of communication comes from body language, actually, right? So you think about what it is that we're using as data to understand what maybe someone else is feeling as, you know, probably reading their, their face, um, trying to understand or reading a room, uh, trying to, to figure out what, what is the temperature here? What am I, what am I getting? Um, and it actually... Only 7% of communication comes from words that are spoken, right? That actually the verbal part of it is a much lower part of what uh, what you use to understand what uh, is being communicated and what you perceive. And so these other um, percentages I really wanted to... So John Gottman is a uh, well-known couples uh, therapist and researcher. He actually, he and his wife, Julie done quite a lot um, in terms of creating an evidence-based treatment for, for couples. And um, they did a, a Sir John Gottman actually did a survey um, with a, a lot of couples. And what he found uh, is that he could predict, you know, everyone wants to know, right? When I, when I meet with questions is, are we going to make it? You know, what do you think? Are we going to make it? And, and so that, that, that becomes a, a real stress and a, a worry for people. Um, what he found is that he was like, yeah, we actually can predict some of the things that make relationships more or less successful. And then the number one predictor of divorce is contempt. So if you think about um, what is contempt, you know, what does that look like? You know, when you're kind of being sarcastic, um, kind of, you know, uh, kind of backstabbing or, or saying something kind of that putting someone down inadvertently. Um, and so uh, that, that that kind of communication happens and that he also found that or states that 96% of the time you can predict the outcome of a conversation based on the first three minutes, which I think is fascinating, right? But if you think about the, when communication doesn't go well, you know, when we're stressed, when some of those emotions are underneath the surface, it may be something got triggered and you're kind of a zero, again, zero to 5,000 in a millisecond, um, what happened in that moment. And so you might kind of lash back, right? It's like the defensive reaction because you feel like you're being attacked. So you're going to attack back because you're protecting yourself. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about this. He calls it kind of a harsh kind of way to start a conversation. Um, and that that generally predicts that it's not going to go well, not surprisingly, but we're going to um, talk a little bit about how can we avoid that. Oh, um, the science. Okay, so don't be um, um, too overwhelmed <laughs> by science. Um, we're we're going to keep this pretty simple because also I'm not an emotions researcher, so I need to keep it simple for myself, um, firstly. So 
Um, the science basically is just to be open to recognize that your perceptions are not always right. And we already went over that with the elephant versus the bull. And even I really love that, um, the, that, you know, the elephants embracing the bull. So just really two things from cognitive psychology that I find have really helped me. So the first concept is mindset. And the second concept is deliberate practice. So mindset is Carol Dweck's concept, and she has written a book on it. It's called Mindset, if you want to get that. My sister um, first sent this book to me, actually, when my um, daughter was five and starting kindergarten. And she mailed it to me and she said, hey, you know, just check out this book. It'll probably help you um, as, you know, your daughter starts navigating through the school system and you you know, help her along. So a fixed mindset, I think is really how I grew up. Um, and it's um, in, in terms of schooling, it's sort of like, okay, you're X amount of smart, you know, and that doesn't really change. So you're either smart or you're not smart, or maybe you're somewhere in between, or you're super smart or like just a little bit smart, but that's the way it is. That's a fixed mindset. And you can have a fixed mindset about yourself and usually then a fixed mindset about other people. And then there's a growth mindset instead, which is better, right? More ideal, according to Carol Dweck. And I would agree with that. A growth mindset is, yes, I can change. Her name is Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K. And uh, um, I'll type it into the chat later as well. Um, But Carol Dweck, her growth mindset is, I can change. Thank you, Danielle. Um, I can change. And um, it's not fixed. Um, I might not be able to do this right now, but I can do it later. And I think if anyone has uh, played a sport or um, played a musical instrument or maybe played chess, um, you know that, that I'm not a good chess player right now. I can grow in it. I can be better. Now, one thing about this mindset, another way to think about it is talent. So fixed mindset is kind of like talent inborn and a growth mindset is a little bit like um, hard work, right? And so a growth mindset is about hard work. It's about, okay, this is hard and I like it. (laughs) And the challenge is good. A fixed mindset is, oh, this is hard for me. That means I'm not smart. So I'm going to avoid this from now on. And so a fixed mindset really prevents kids in a school setting from being willing to learn. Um, And so even a quote unquote smart kid, say, actually doesn't learn as much as they could because they don't actually want to be challenged if they have that fixed mindset. So the growth mindset really allows people to perform beyond maybe what you would initially predict. We think it's relevant to to emotional intelligence because we think that, you know, first some of us, we, you know, we, we want, you need to have a growth mindset in terms of your own emotions too, in terms of your emotional intelligence, right? Thinking that you can also learn how to um, kind of name your emotions, understand your emotions, manage your emotions. And that, that, that uh, if you, if you kind of think, oh, I'm just not good at that. You know, I'm someone who um, I just, I, I'm, I'm reactive. I have, I have a temper. That's just the way it is. Um, versus you know, no, I can, I can learn these things. These are tools. This is a skill that I can develop. And so that's part of what we wanted to really emphasize here. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so then deliberate practice, it just means that when you're faced with a challenge, you have to try, you know, you have to work harder and you have to deliberately practice. It can't just be sort of a nebulous, okay, I'll try again next time. It's you have to ideally set a particular goal that is measurable. So for in terms of this surviving the holidays, it could be something like, okay, I tend to get angry when my mom asks me about X. Um, The next time she asks me, it might just be once, right? The next time she asks me, I'm going to keep my cool. Um, And that could be deliberate practice. Just one time, one episode, one goal, that's it. Or you can set up, you know, three times, you know, it can be whatever you want, but you set a small goal that's achievable. It might be a hard goal to achieve, but still it's achieved. Not like, okay, in the next week, I'm going to become an NBA player and be really good at it. You know, so that's not really deliberate practice. All right. And Susan, do you, you want to say something about deliberate practice? Yeah. So I, this is probably one of the things that I talk about most with the couples that I work with, right? That, you know, when, when um, we, once we get to a point where we understand, okay, here are our goals, what we're trying to work on. Um, and I will tell you that 99% of the time, communi- you know, better communication, um, increased connection are part of the goal. 
that that's always part of it. And I, I would say with every, you know, think about with your relationships, communication and connection are part of every relationship. And sometimes it's better and sometimes it's worse, but you can see the, the way that that plays out in a relationship. And so um, I think it's really, it's so key to understand that communi- communicating better, connecting more, it is about practice. It takes conscious effort to think about. I mean, even for for the two of us, my sister and we're very close um, and we live across the country, <laughs> but it, and it's sometimes it's hard to connect, right? It's hard to connect because we don't want to connect on video. We don't actually necessarily really want to connect on the phone. And so, but, you know, we have to figure out how, how are we going to do it? And we have to kind of make that time or make the effort in order to do that. And it's not for lack of desire, right? And I think that often comes up in our relationships. It's not for lack of desire that we want to communicate better with our families or with our kids or with our coworkers. Um, but sometimes it's not working. And when it's not working, kind of really think about, okay, as Christine was just kind of breaking down, thinking about what is the dynamic? Where does the stress happen? Where, where does it go wrong? And then what can you inject in that moment to, dif- to do differently? And then being conscious about this is a thing I'm going to try. This is a thing I'm going to practice. Um, I always kind of use that example of an NBA player, you know, who's um, trying to shoot free throws. I don't know why. I'm like not a huge sports person, but this is always the example that comes to mind. If you think about, you know, a three point shot, uh, I mean, a a free throw shot, every player has got to be able to do free throws. Right. So they're practicing. If you think it's an NBA, NBA player, you expect like they can do this, but they practice those those shots. And you know, the way that you practice maybe, okay, I've got to be thoughtful, but I'm going to move my, you know, I'm going to have my stance this way, or I'm going to, you, you know, use my hands this way, but to kind of really think about what is it that you're going to do differently, or how is it you're going to practice paying attention to that and collecting data about it. So I think that's a really important thing to recognize that when we are trying to increase our emotional intelligence, we can do it. We can increase our communication connection with emotional intelligence, but to kind of be very deliberate about what are the skills and strategies that we're going to use. So that takes us to the question. So can you tell and retell the story in a different way? And this is a postcard actually from, you know, a little while back, a um, couple hundred years back. And um, there's two ways to interpret this image and maybe more than two, since also um, with the bull elephant, um, image, you guys opened my eyes in a new way, which is awesome. So I don't know if you want to put in the chat what you guys see here. Um, We don't have another poll. Uh, We're trying to spare you guys from too much polling. But um, okay, so Amanda, thank you, Amanda. Amanda says wife. Um, So is it a young wife that you see? So I see a woman looking over her shoulder like this, and she has a black necklace on, like a little choker. Um, and then Wara, hopefully I said that correctly, um, she sees mother-in-law. Um, Arna Tress, hopefully I say that well as well, uh, correctly as well. She says young lady and old lady, and exactly. So um, um, and Andrea first saw an old woman looking down, young woman and an old lady. They see both. Yes. So I usually see the woman looking like this with the black choker against her neck. That jo- black choker is the mouth of the older woman and her chin is coming down from the mouth. If you go up from the black choker, it's the nose of the older lady in case that you can't see that. Um, Susan had a little bit of trouble. Oh, yes, I had. (laughs) I had a lot of trouble. I had an epiphany when we were um, going through our presentation the other day. I've seen this image before, but I always had a very hard time seeing the older woman because the young woman is so obvious to me. And I it's interesting because once Christine pointed out and kind of helped me see, she had to kind of point out, this is the mouth, this is the chin, this is the nose, and then I could see it. But interestingly, even when I was looking at it today, when I first came on, I was like, oh, wait, I can't see, I can't see the old woman again, um, even though I know that that she was there. So it took a moment um, because the I think the younger woman, it's so dominant and strong to me that it's really hard to see past that, which you know, maybe tells you something about what happens in my communication dynamics when I um, see the right, my, my point of view. 
Susan is very strong minded. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so Lori, you know, you're not alone though. So Lori Pierce agrees. She really didn't see the older woman. She's very excited. It sounds like from the chat to see the young woman. And um, I love actually what um, Lisa Goldner put in. Thank you. So you guys are teaching me, which I love. Um, um, just like with the bull elephant. So um, Lisa Goldner put, she sees a young woman growing from young to old. So that's a really cool way to think of it too. So I, this is just an example of, we can have one thought in our mind, it's a young woman or it's a witch or it's a wife. And it can actually be interpreted a different way and others can actually help us, right? So Yeah, and so I, I see D was saying she couldn't see the young woman. And so just- to help you out. And then this is the nose and then with her eyelashes. So she's kind of looking over her shoulder like this. And then this is her hair um, and maybe like a scarf or something. So hopefully that, that helps you. Yeah. Do you see it Laverne? I hope so. Let us know. Um, we'll show it again in a little bit. So emotional intelligence in terms of being able to see the young woman or the old woman, um, oh, she doesn't see it. Okay, we'll show it again and we'll try to point it out. Um, but um, really it's it's this kind of optical illusion or you know, sort of double image is really about seeing, right? Is what we're seeing really correct? Um, both the young and the old woman, both that bull and elephant, it's all coming into in through our visual system, but our brain changes it, right? And if we're incorrect, maybe with our perception, you know, in terms of like what happens, you know, a negative outcome, maybe it's it's twisting it in the wrong way. Um, so we really do have to maybe think twice at least, or maybe even more than twice about what we're observing, what our brain is really telling us that we're observing. Same thing with what we feel, just really wonder, is it really correct what I'm feeling? I mean, not that it's wrong to feel a certain way. That's not what we're saying. There's no right or wrong emotion, but just to, to again, name it, like we've been saying, and, and to really think about why do I feel that way? And am I really naming it correctly? Because um, as we mentioned in that Atlas of the Heart book by Brene Brown, there are many, many nuances. And if I've realized the better that I can get um, at getting better about what I really feel, it can help me know what to do next. Um, and then hearing, same thing. Optical illusions are also auditory illusions. Um, and the tone concept, right? I think it was um, um, Carol, I think Carol, who said, yes, tone. Her mom always emphasized the tone. And it's true. Really often we listen to the tone and then we we stop listening to the actual words and we've already decided what's going to come next. So really just think twice about what you see, hear, and feel. Yeah. So that's, that's it. I really love this. And um, Christine's written a book that she'll talk about the, the end. Uh, but, you know, the basis of this was really checking your perceptions. And if you check and double check, the key is to double check, right? Because again, we're, we're all busy in our, and especially in today's age where we're in information overload, you think about, we have so much information coming at us all the time. And actually our society uh, really embraces and actually even rewards this instant gratification mentality and kind of the instant reactiveness, right? Whether it's responding on social media, whether it's texting someone right away, um, but we like this. And the challenge with that is sometimes we don't have that time to double check uh, what we're thinking, feeling, and um, seeing. Uh, and instead, what we're doing is we're just reacting. We're always in that responding mode. And if you think about what happens, I, look, I know for myself that when I feel stressed, that's what I'm doing is I'm just reacting. I'm like, get, I got stuff. I'm taking it off my list and I'm going down, um, down it and, and crossing things off. Right. So rather than being able to kind of take a moment, um, and really think about what am I seeing right now? Um, is it accurate? So again, that question, you know, of, um, you know, what it, you know, can you retell the story in a different way? Is it the, 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 the story that you just saw or the story that you just created in that one second? Is that accurate? So, so it sounds easy. So, yeah. We we think I think it's hard. <laughs> So as as we've shown with those just two brief um, optical illusions, we can we can get the story sort of in a way wrong if the other person sees it a different way and we're just not meeting. So um, we can misperceive. And and what I mean by that, it's in relation to other people. All right. So then we're gonna move on to the next. So 
Um, and this is really important that when we misperceive, it can be partially or maybe wholly because emotions are getting in the way, just like with that tone thing, right? The tone we hear in someone's voice, even if I'm like saying, I love you, if I'm like, I really love you, then they don't, you don't need, it doesn't matter what I just said. The contempt that's there in my tone um, really negates the actual words, right? So emotions get in the way. This is sort of a fun little exercise we're going to do. So I want you to read off the color of the letters um, of that each word is written in. So I'll do it with you guys and I won't be able to hear you, but go ahead. So I say purple, red, green, yellow. Easy, right? Not hard. Okay, so next slide, we're gonna do it also. So again, read the color off. So I'll do it, red, green, purple, yellow. And I wasn't doing that on purpose, but you may have noticed that it was harder for me in the sense that it was slower for me to read off the color on this slide compared to the prior. And that's because this is called the emotional Stroop test, S-T-R-O-O-P, Stroop. And what this shows you is that because reading is sort of faster and instinctual for most of, most of us, because most of the time, no one's really saying, what color are these words? And, you know, unless you're sort of putting together some kind of graphic design or um, an art piece of art, reading these words, hate, dead, pox, bomb, even reading them aloud right now, they're a little bit kind of like, oh, what's going on? And so when I read them, my brain kind of stops and there's a little pause before I can think, oh, and what color is this word? Whereas if we go back quickly to the prior slide, these words, um, box, gate, deer, comb, they're neutral. Um, you know, they don't really have any emotion attached to it. So it's easy, purple, red, green, yellow. And then if we go back to the next one, I'll try to do it as fast. Um, to the next slide, um, red, green, purple, yellow. You can see still, even though I know what this test is after, I can't say these colors as fast as I can do the others. So um, we'll, we'll move on, because um, I know that we're already at 145. Yeah. You wanna so make sure we get to questions, and, and, and I think there's some good ones already in the, the chat that I definitely wanna um, be able to address, but let us quickly give you some tips and tricks. Um, uh, you know, for, for what you might be able to, to uh, do to manage the holidays. Yeah. So I think these tips and tricks will address at least partially some of the things that have been coming through in the chat. So this map we've already shown you, um, and just we've emphasized that because for me, this is the first step. It may not be, not everyone does things the same way. I think that's the joy, right, partially of being human, that we're all different. Um, but for me, um, this is this is the step that I start with. How do I really feel? How do I think the other person feels? And I do really more and more think, I don't know, I can assume. And I would say more than half the time I'm wrong. So I can just only really control and maybe not even control myself, but I can at least name it and then try to use that emotion to sort of have the outcome that I want. So that's the importance of naming for me. Once I name it, I can sort of have insight into why I'm maybe, maybe actually not why I'm feeling that way, but what I want to happen afterward. So if I'm feeling happy, that generally matches with, okay, I'm like excited. This is a good thing. Um, I want to proceed, right? But with the holidays, some of the things that have come, been coming through the chat Holidays are not actually universally a joyful time for people, right? Um, someone shared, and thank you for sharing that, that their their father passed away. And so it's actually a sad time, right? So we can map, okay, I feel sad. And does that match? Do you actually want to mourn a family member during this time? So if yes, then that, that sadness matches and that's good. And the meaning can be like, why do I feel that way? But it's because I miss I miss him, you know, and do I actually want that to change? I would maybe say no, you know, but that's something that every person has to answer themselves, right? Um, I've been um, separately, you know, for something sort of reading that grief is a way actually to express love. And so in that sense, it's actually a very positive emotion. Um, and that maybe, you know, we're just too rigid sometimes about, and this has come up in the chat, about expectations. Um, and that's also been in the news too, sort of toxic positivity where it's only okay if you're excited and happy and even more so during the holidays. So I think that's where a lot of stress can come through for me, that there is this expectation and this um um, sort of performative aspect of how I have to act, because I'll just say, 
I feel sad right now. And there's a really good reason for it. And I want to feel sad right now. And I want that space to do it in. So you don't need to move that emotion, meaning to change it if it's appropriate. And only you can really know if that's appropriate for yourself. So I'll, I'll pass it on to Susan now. Yeah, I, I think that it's so well, well said. And, you know, I, um, I thank you for, for bringing that question up, Amanda, in the chat you know, about grief, because that is something that is particular can be particularly hard um, as Christine was saying during the holidays, you know, this is a time where there's a lot of expectation, a lot of social expectation about what you're supposed to be doing and how you're supposed to be feeling. Um, and, um, and for many, it is a, it is a challenging time because, you know, there are a lot of people who have either experienced losses, tragic losses, um, kind of health concerns, um, during, during this time. Um, and so it, it, it becomes an anniversary um, of those those losses um, or challenges, um, or it um, can be a time that's a reminder of of the people who are not there right during this time um, when maybe others are gathering, um, and and so it can be a time that feels even more isolating um, or lonely. And so you know this question around how how can you kind of um, manage both, right? Like maybe I'm really, really excited and happy and, and just looking forward to holidays and getting together and, you know, parties and, and all of that. Um, and also recognizing that I have friends who've, you know, experienced tragic, um, traumatic losses um, during this time and are really suffering. And so how do you manage that? So it's not that mapping how we feel or matching how we feel even means that we have to take on the feelings of someone else, right? So now I should, you know, kind of set my my joy or excitement aside um, to kind of have the same emotion as someone. But it is, I think, about that when we talk about communicating, right? Being able to to acknowledge and share what you're really feeling, and hear what someone else is really feeling, and then be able to sit with that together. Um, I think that some some other. Uh, uh, ways, you know, just kind of quickly as a tip is um, kind of for, for people who are grieving and have losses, you know, to be able to kind of form some sort of ritual um, or of connection can be can be um, useful or helpful, I should say, um, you know, kind of deciding together, maybe if you have had a loss, deciding with others, um, you know, maybe other family members or other friends, how you might want to, uh, you know, kind of mark that that time. And, and for different people, it may be different. For some people, it may be more of a celebratory way to mark that person's life. For others, it may be about saying, you know, this is going to be a really sad moment for me. But, you know, asking the question, you know, sometimes, again, I think what Christine was saying is so important to, I would like to underline, is that sometimes, you know, we we don't think it's okay, or we're afraid, you know, to kind of bring up the, the harder things. Um, and, you know, we think about, Every person I've talked to who has had a loss or is a challenge uh, has appreciated that sincere being asked, how are you doing? When they they have that, they, they sense that it's coming from a sincere place because it they feel seen, you know, to know like, no, you, you're recognizing this is not an easy time for me. Um, it's not that they need you to abandon your happiness or joy or excitement, but see that this is a different time for me. Um, so we know that this that's a lot. And so we that's why we kind of narrowed it down to this first question, um, as Christine was saying, like, let's have a starting point. And, it, you know, sometimes we get overwhelmed, actually, when we think, OK, I'm here, I'm going to I'm going to develop my emotional intelligence. And now I have to do 50 things in order to do it. No, you can start with one. Um, so let's just, you know, make sure that we we uh, don't walk away burdening ourselves even more with all the things that we need to do. Um, a few relationship hacks really quickly. Um, you know, I think I'd mentioned John Gottman and Julie Gottman, a couple of therapists, uh, they talk about this idea of gentle startup. So when you're having a communication or a conflict, how do you try to, to maximize connecting with someone in that moment to talk about something, to communicate effectively versus getting to a fight or argument or blowing up, right? So, um, they use this little um, kind of tactic where it says, you say, I feel, and you fill in the, fill in the emotion, um, when you 
probably do X, Y, or Z. I need this from you, right? So, um, so for example, maybe I would say I feel sad um, or neglected when you are always checking your phone when we're together. Um, I need more presence from you. Um, oftentimes where this gets messed up is people will say, I feel like you're always on your phone and you never pay attention to me, right? So that you can see it when you kind of add like before the emotion, <laughs> often what that is, is you're not actually sharing how you're feeling. You're telling the other person what they're doing. Um, so kind of think, think a little bit through that. The rituals of connection are something that um, I was just mentioning is there are lots of ways to, to connect, but again, it takes deliberate practice. You've got to identify how are you going to connect with someone? And so one thing, you know, I love that Michelle Obama had shared when they were in the White House um, that she used to do with her family is at, over dinner, they would all talk about the roses and thorns of the day, right? What were the highlights? the roses, what were the lowlights, the thorns, and it can be very quick. And so this is the other thing to know about connection. Sometimes I think the couples that I work with are overwhelmed by thinking we don't have time. We just, we have a three-year-old and an infant. There is no time to connect. We're just trying to survive and keep our children alive. Right. And, you know, the thing is you can connect in five minutes of being present together and grow that. Right. So it's thinking about how do you really, um, spend time together, and then grow that time. Um, hard conversations. I just mentioned this um, uh, a few minutes ago. It's not only about how you fall into an argument or a, a conflict. It's how you get out of it. It's how you rise up from it. So kind of thinking, you know, hard having hard conversations, kind of confronting those hard things, talking about them. It's you can you it, it's not just about, OK, we got we're in this. It's about like, let's get out of it. Let's, we kind of commit to each other, commit to the relationships that you have, that you want to get out of these conflicts, you know, that you don't want to fight and that that you can partner together to face it together versus letting that conflict come between you. It's last thing, self-care, you know, taking a break, acknowledging, you know what, this is a hard time for me. Um, I'm not kind of feeling this excitement and joy that the everyone around me is feeling seemingly. Um, I, that's, that's, I, I, I need a break. There's too much happening. I do feel this stress. I do feel pressure and kind of paying attention to that voice. Um, bask. I love this word bask because I think you're like basking in the glow of the sun. And that's what kind of comes to mind, but take that moment to kind of just, you know, think, right. Um, not just react, but to think, to think about what you need and then to breathe, to kind of breathe through it, to take some time, um, to, to think through it. So we wanted to, can I say again, um, this was the question. This is the, not rocket science, but this is the question, right? Can you retell the story in a different way with uh, these different tips, with these thoughts? Can you um, challenge your perceptions? Can you double check things? Christine, I didn't know if you wanted to say anything else about this. No, exactly. Yep. So she might not highlight it, but I want to make sure you all know that um, uh, Christine, my sister, wrote this book. Um, do you want to share a little bit about what it's about? So I know the title is a little bulky, and I'll I'll say this just really quickly because I think there are some important questions that we should address from the chat. But I wrote this book really from the patient side um, because I, I didn't have a good healthcare experience with my son um, when he was a little bit around the age of two, and he was misdiagnosed. And so I realized that I, not to be a hypocrite, I was I was doing not so great things with my own patients, just in terms of really seeing them and hearing them and understanding what they're trying to tell me and share with me. So um, I wrote this book really for, for everyone, for patients and patient advocates who really want to get the best care from doctors who are, you know, maybe not in the right headspace. So that's that book. And then um, someone did ask about free resources. The book does cost money. It's an academic book, so it's not the cheapest. So I apologize about that. I don't set prices and I actually am in no way making money from that book at all. Um, but there's this free resource that I started because I think these concepts are so important. And that's a podcast on the next slide. It's called See, Hear, Feel. Um, because I think that's so important. Um, and the podcast 
is um, goes over. There's a, an, an episode with David. There's actually two episodes with David Caruso, who is an um, emotional intelligence expert here at Yale. Um, and um, he's taught me so much. He's mentored me um, through this process of learning about it and trying to be better. So that's all I'll say about that. And then, you know, this is kind of my website, but I just wanted to share that I really do believe that individual stories are so important. Your own story is your story. There isn't a right or wrong about it. It's your story. And so that I do think it's your truth. But I do also believe that what we've been talking about today is that we can sometimes challenge the narratives that we have in our head about why things are a certain way or how we are. Again, that fixed mindset and and ask ourselves right? The questions around, is this, is this the way I see this? Is this the way this relationship is? Is this, can anything be changed or different? Um, so we left less time than we uh, had hoped for, for the Q&A, but I think there were some good questions that, that came up um, in the chat. What an incredible, incredible wealth of important information. So timely, just in time, I might say. (laughs) Um, You know, we're so wired for connection as human beings. And I guess, ironically, it can be one of the most challenging um, dynamics to navigate. But having the language and education in a way that feels accessible and digestible and applicable is so unique. So truly, thank thank you so much. Um, we have time for one question. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to read, this was, this came in through the chat. So the question is, how can we express joy for others who are celebrating with their families while personally feeling such profound loss at being alone or by ourselves during the holidays? Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I would say to that is your feelings are your feelings and they're important. And so you know, it is, I think connection is about being able to share how you feel. And, um, and I think to the extent that we feel like we can be authentic, and this is what I get from my, my clients, right? The, the extent to which we feel like we can be authentic and share our truth of what we're feeling is when you feel seen, um, when you start to, to have the opportunity to feel understood. So I think trying to release yourself from the pressure to feel like you have to reflect the joy that you're seeing um, f- with whomever it is that's around you. And instead be able to, sh- to say, you know, th- I that's just not what I feel right now. And this is what I feel. And to be able to connect on that because we don't all have to feel the same thing despite what the media and um, stores are telling you right now. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I just want to say, I think... Um you know, Pam's question about just, she really wants to soak up the experience. A lot of people have shared their grieving. And um, what I would say is, um, you know, my own family, we have, you know, an acute medical condition going on and it's hard. And um, some of the family might know, some other members might not, you, you know, you might not want to share completely. Some family members know how much you're grieving. Other people you don't have a great relationship with, you don't even want to tell them. And so I think it's it's really about, for me, what works is naming what I feel and think, okay, I know that I am really sad about this and I can try to predict I'm going to need five minutes a day to really reset myself and have know that I'm going to have that time so that um, I can focus on others for this. And maybe it's only five, right? Like if you're a mom and you're really busy, um, five minutes doesn't sound like a lot, but um, to some moms, I think that's like, an eternity, if you can carve that out. Absolutely. And you mentioned as well in the chat, Christine, I'm just going to read it, that for you, it's about boundaries, really naming your own feelings and setting a boundary around that and guiding what you truly want. Um, Boundaries are so important and so hard. (laughs) Can I say one thing really quick, Shelby? I know we we probably have to end, but I just saw one question that I really wanted to respond to about what if that argument just happened last week? Um, You know, you can always go back to it, right? And I know it's a challenge because so many times when people have conflict, you don't want to revisit it. There are people are afraid to revisit. You're like, I don't want to fight again. I don't want to get back in that. But I think there's actually a lot of value in being able to sometimes have that time to reflect. You know, again, if we we say too many times we're pressured to react and respond in the moment. And if you can say, okay, you know what? I, I had a second, I had some time, I had a day, I had a week to think about this some and reflect and realize and kind of make some connections and think about 
what it is that happened, you know, to kind of go back and say, you know what, can we talk about what happened and let me share with you what I feel or what I learned. Um, and to, so to kind of think about, again, remember that that side about gentle startup to approach the conversation by saying, I want to talk about this with you again, not because I want to rehash it, not because I want to fight about it, but because I want to connect with you. And I want to kind of, um, I want us to, to, to grow together from that experience instead of having this be an experience that comes between us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Well, thank you both so much, Dr. Susan Coe, Dr. Christine Coe. What incredibly potent learnings that we all get to walk away with today as we embrace the highs and lows of the holiday season. I think it's so helpful to realize that, you know, um, times that can be so emotionally stressful or even charged for so many, they don't necessarily have to be so long as we have the right tools and mindsets. So just to reiterate some of the things you shared, the power of being able to name and discern your feelings to double check our perceptions and think twice about how we see, hear, and feel. If you all want more content from the upside on different ways to protect and preserve your relational well being over the holidays, I'm going to pop a few links into the chat right now. And these will also be included in the follow up email that you'll receive after completing the survey for today's webinar. On behalf of Twill, I'd like to extend our sincere gratitude for you all being here today. We hope that you enjoyed it. Please be sure to tune in for next month's webinar, How to Flourish in Our Age of Anxiety, which you'll be able to register for in the coming weeks. Thank you all and continue to invest in your well-being. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for participating.